The Unshackled Waves, episode 256. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. The UK has a new Prime Minister after the members of the Conservative Party elected by a margin of two to one. Boris Johnson is their new leader to replace Theresa May. There is now a lot of optimism that as a Brexit supporter he can deliver what the British people voted for in 2016 and the UK can leave the European Union by October 31st. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern visited Australia last week to give a speech at Melbourne's Town Hall on good governance and met with Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews to discuss her well-being budget. But Ardern failed in a diplomatic mission with the Morrison government not backing down on its policy of deporting New Zealand-born criminals from Australia. The Adam Goods documentary, The Final Quarter, about the booing saga in the final years of his career, premiered on Network 10 last week. The media narrative now is that the booing was racially motivated, but that is only because Goods, once he became Australian of the Year, labelled Australia as racist. This led to resentment from AFL fans and the booing began. Master Chef Judge George Calambaras has admitted to underpaying workers at his chain of restaurants to the tune of $7.83 million. He was fined 200000 by the Fair Work Commission. There was a lot of pressure on Network 10 to sack him from the show, but in the end, all judges are leaving the show because, ironically, they believe they weren't being paid enough despite being on million-dollar salaries. To digest all these stories is, once again, the senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, the UK has a new Prime Minister. Well, they should have been the Prime Minister three years ago. Uh, Boris Johnson was uh, elected by the Conservative Party members in the, the UK to replace uh, Theresa May after she announced that she would be stepping down uh, back in May after uh, three attempts to pass her negotiated Brexit deal uh, did not uh, go through Parliament. So this was quite a grueling process to elect a replacement because there were five ballots of Conservative Party MPs whittling it down to a final two, which was Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt, who is a moderate in the Conservative Party. He supported the Remain campaign during the, the 2016 Brexit uh, referendum, but it was a pretty convincing uh, win from the uh, members to uh, Boris Johnson. He won with 92,000 votes to Jeremy Hunt's uh, 46,000. So a two to one victory gives him a strong mandate uh, against the, the, the naysayers and the, the Stop Boris uh, faction in his party. And finally, we hope that he can deliver Brexit, deal or no deal, by October 31st. That's right. I mean, I'm hoping that that's the case as well. He's won a, a resounding victory within his own um, within his own party. Uh, their members have voted for him. He's somebody that's always uh, been a popular face, um, a love it or hate it type of person, and somebody uh, that will hopefully bring some change. I mean, a lot of people, um, at least within the nationalist camp, are sceptical, but in saying that, um, at the very least, we have somebody that is serious about bringing on Brexit and taking us out, or, or taking themselves out, so to speak, um, of the EU, uh, deal or no deal, which really is what it should be. I mean, I personally think that they should be exiting the EU with no deal because that's what people voted for. Um, a deal to me is a compromise. It isn't what people wanted. People no longer want the EU to be a shadow uh, behind them. They want to rule and, and be um, a national sovereign um, nation and to continue to be able to do what they do best. And this is what people want. Um, there, there is a big divide within the, within the public, within Britain. So it will be interesting to see how it all plays out. Well, they were supposed to leave the European Union back in March, but uh, Theresa May missed uh, that deadline. So it got extended to October 31st. But the deal she negotiated with the, the European Union, it was considered Brexit in name only because the, the UK would be largely bound by most of the, the EU regulations that 
the, the UK public voted to, to leave in in 2016. Uh, so it, well, it didn't satisfy the, the hard uh, Brexiteers in her party. And because the, uh, uh, the UK courts said that uh, the parliament had to vote on the final uh, Brexit deal, that complicated the process because the, the Conservatives don't have a majority and the, the Labour parties divided under Corbyn, they're, they're supporting Brexit, but under uh, certain conditions. So it was messy. But you hope now that Boris Johnson elected with such a strong mandate from the party base that uh, these uh, leftover Remainers uh, in the, the Conservative Party, and Theresa May herself was a soft uh, Remainer, hence why you know, she didn't go for the f full Brexit, but they fall into line now that the base of the party wants a, a hard Brexit, they've elected Boris Johnson to do it, fall into line and make sure that you, know, you fulfil what the British people voted for. Yeah, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. I mean, people want to um, have these politicians deliver what was voted on. I mean, this happened over three years ago. Uh, I remember it quite well because on the weekend that it happened was when uh, my daughter was born. So I remember it being in the paper at the time. It was a very big, uh, big result and a big issue. And for three years, this could have been resolved already and be done with, but they continued to... Um, talk about it and have little action. I mean, this could have been an issue that uh, as the vote occurred straight after it, they should have put it in place. And it was really a shame that they had to get Parliament to vote on it because when that sort of situation occurs, it makes it very difficult um, to get the amount of votes needed. And I think that's what the problem is there, uh, having to get everybody to decide not only in other parties, but also in your own, when everybody had different views of what uh, a Brexit should look like. So I'm just hoping that they get on with the job. And I mean, I think it, it, it will motivate other countries to go the same way. We've already seen uh, other countries within uh, Europe, um, very anti-EU parties get up and become even um, uh, ruling parties, for instance, in, uh, in Hungary and Italy. So we're really seeing a, a movement here because of people rejecting this kind of... Uh, I guess you could say a globalist, uh, authoritarian sort of um, regime, which is what, what the EU is, uh, telling uh, all these nations how to run their own countries and, and having this power uh, dictating um, all these uh, particular issues. And I think people just really want to embrace their own identity and, and be able to rule their countries without any external influence. And if the, the UK political class thought that they could just shift Brexit off to the side and not implement it and the public wouldn't notice, they were mistaken. Because of the, the Brexit delay, it meant that uh, the UK participated in the, the European parliamentary elections back in May and the, the Brexit party uh, came first with over 30% of the vote and the, the Conservative and Labour parties, which are in the, the House of Commons uh, fighting over the, the, the Brexit deal, they got decimated in the vote. And so that was a reminder to the, the politicians that you've got to deliver Brexit. I mean, uh, Nigel Farage, like last year, UKIP was, was falling apart and Nigel Farage left and set up the Brexit party. It was a party that was less than one year old, yet came first in the, the European UK elections. That's a pretty stunning achievement. It is, and people want to get this uh, issue out of the way and solved. And um, I think it was a great result to have a, uh, a third party, a third force, uh, be able to uh, claim such a victory in the European um, elections. And it, it will be seen uh, as to the uh, elections coming up in the next couple of years, whenever that is to occur, how they would face um, there now that uh, Boris Johnson is PM, whether they would have that same sort of resounding victory or whether they will uh, be pushed back and not be able to get as many votes because of the leadership change. But at the end of the day, uh, people have to realise that regardless of consequences, and the consequences are very far, well, very, very little, I would, I would, I would say, but um, people just have to get this done. I mean, that's what they want. And, you know, 
I mean, if Scotland or Northern Ireland have an issue with it and they want to part, then so be it. I mean, uh, really, it, it just at this point, pe people have to focus on what their constituency, what their their people have voted for, and that's what they voted for, and that's what they have to deliver. Uh, Boris Johnson, he's commonly referred to as the, the UK's uh, Trump. Uh, the, the most obvious example is uh, uh, Boris Johnson has uh, qu uh, quite a elaborate uh, hairstyle like uh, Trump, but they're, they're both uh, flamboyant and, sh and showman in their, their public persona. Uh, Boris Johnson has had a colourful uh, personal life, and before he was a politician, he was a, a journalist, and so he's been in the public eye for over 30 years, uh, like Trump. And uh, Boris Johnson was was uh, Trump's uh, choice to uh, become the, the the new prime minister, and uh, if you had a look at uh, Boris Johnson's uh, victory speech, it was classic uh, Boris, where he's like, "This isn't, uh, we're not in a crisis." Uh, he 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 spoke about where we're going to energize Britain because his his ca his campaign slogan was "Deliver Brexit, unite uh, unite the the country, and defeat Labour." Uh, which the acronym was DUD, and so he added energize at the end for it to be DUDE. And uh, so, so he was like, this is going to be an exciting time, we're going to deliver tax cuts, we're going to build uh, the infrastructure, To he, he, we want to unite the party, you know, there's so much opportunity for us leaving with uh, the EU. It was a, it was a classic, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, cl classic, uh, as I said, uh, Boris, uh, he, put, he put, on, put on a show, uh, d uh, delivered lots of lots of character to it, and well, it's refreshing from yeah Theresa May's uh, bland style. Yeah, yeah, she was a very bland character. Didn't really have much uh, bit much personality, and uh, I think people didn't really uh, warm up to her uh, when it comes. So, I mean, people have to understand that it's not only um, someone's ideological uh, positioning within a within a party and in politics, but also whether people can actually warm to who you are as a person. And that's something that she wasn't able to achieve. And he has been able to achieve that. And I think it shows a lot, and I think it's a good thing that we have politicians now that are your love it or hate it type of politicians. I think we need more of them because they're the type of people that stand for something or at the very least have more principles um, within their uh, ideological sort of framework. And when you have politicians that are very in the middle and, you know, could drift either way and get a bit of support from here, a bit of a support from there, those people there don't really believe in anything. Uh, they're career politicians. And that's not what we need right now. I think we're over that. And I think we need people that you either love them or hate them. That really shows that that person has a strong ideological stance, whether you support it or not. And I think that's what is needed in politics. Well... If the left are triggered by your election as leader, then obviously there must be something uh, uh, good to you because, well, Boris, he's, he's said many politically incorrect things over the years, which uh, the left have been quite triggered over. He described gay men as uh, bum boys and uh, women in the burqa as, as something that you put a, a, a letter in comparing them to, to a letterbox. So, I mean, he has, like, the UK is probably one of the most politically correct anti-free speech uh, countries in, in the West, but he's managed to get away with saying some colourful things, and so there is hope in that regard. There is, and I think uh, what people have to also understand is that not only is it very important that we have candidates that are very um, anti-PC and that basically speak in the same way that someone would speak at a pub. I think that, that that's how you relate to people, to be able to speak like a normal person rather than a robot. And also another thing to add is that once you uh, come out and say some things that are deemed controversial or not mainstream like he has, the worst thing you could do is to buckle down and um, basically come out and apologise and say um, that for whatever reason you were drunk at the time and this and that and you weren't able to um, articulate what you were saying because that ultimately uh, makes you um, admit defeat and it basically ruins your career. A lot of people think that by doing that they're able to then uh, get back in the game but it actually damages a profile 
Uh, it really does. And we've seen it so often when people do this. Uh, people lose respect over these sort of people. Uh, even if they're people that they don't really um, agree with, if you see people that are principled and even when put under pressure, they say, yep, yeah, you know, I stand by what I said and I don't care, then they can't really attack you any further. They can continue to say, oh, this person is mean, but at the end of the day, uh, that's beyond what they can do. Um, it, it just makes you look like a principled person, regardless of what principle it is, and people do have respect for that. But if you do buckle down and give in, then that will destroy you. And I think we have seen time and time again with people like Annie, with other people that when they were put under pressure, they didn't admit defeat, they were very strong in their stance and never backed down. And that's why they were very popular with voters. People were able to relate to that. They didn't want uh, people that uh, were basically puppets, you know, they wanted people that would be able to go up there, speak their mind and not care. Because that is how the normal person, the average person is. They, they, within a household, uh, within um, a group of friends, for instance, and so forth, they are able to talk to them without a PC sort of filter. And I think that's what we need in our representatives as well. Well, Boris Johnson, we've known what he's stood for. As I said, he's been in the public eye for 30 years. He told us what he wants to do as Prime Minister. Now comes the big challenge, can he implement it, given Britain's fractured political culture. That is the, the, the big thing. We we know what he's promised. Now comes the, the, the ultimate test. So obviously we're wishing him the, the the best of luck. And well, if he can't save the, the UK and get it out of the EU, then I don't think anyone can. That's right. I mean, with the amount of coverage that this sort of uh, topic has got over the last couple of years, you'd expect this really to boil over and, and come to a conclusion. I hope it does because I'm sick of hearing about it in the news. And um, we want results. Uh, ultimately, we want results. We want to know what's going on. And we want the people to have uh, their verdict that they decided at the ballot box actually be put in writing and be counted. Uh, the worst thing is when you have politicians that can continue to uh, vote against the interests of the people because it goes against their personal interests. And that's not what representatives should be doing. They should be representing uh, the people and doing what is right. And I think that it is right to exit the EU and they should continue to go down that line and make sure that it happens. Australia's left for well, they were in a form of heaven last week when their, their poster girl Jacinta Ardern visited uh, Melbourne as uh, she was invited by the Lord Mayor Sally Cap to, to give a speech about uh, good governance and she got to meet her well, progressive counterpart in Australia, Premier Daniel Andrews, who uh, wanted to discuss with her her, her wellness uh, budget, which, well, forget about budgets being about economic uh, responsibility and uh, fiscal discipline. Uh, it's all about uh, social justice, mental health, homelessness. You know, he cares about uh, surpluses and, and deficits. Now, in her speech, uh, she, she obviously sees herself as the antithesis of, of Donald Trump. She said, you can either choose to capitalize on, on fear, stoke it and politically benefit from it, or you can run a counter narrative. You can talk about hope. You can talk about solutions to the problems. And uh, as the MC for, for that speech said, the, there was 2,000 people in Melbourne's town hall, uh, fanboys and fangirls. I thought that was that was pretty accurate of uh, fawning over over these motherhood statements that she you know gives out. It just makes you want to vomit. Uh, I mean, she's another character at least where. Um, uh, one thing I will say is that, like Boris, but on the other opposite side, she is a love it or hate it person too. So I think that that is good that we are able to have uh, these type of characters that are very one-sided, um, though it is on the wrong side in my view. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, who, what would you expect? I mean, the people that are going to go visit her um, are of a particular background. You know, you're, you're very typical Melbourneian sort of uh, CBD upper class elite. Her, her ideology, I would say, is very uh, has very little difference to Daniel Andrews. So I think they would have been a um, uh, a very uh, very uh, closely ideological couple there. I mean, she she has really done 
a lot of damage in her own country. I mean, she she's used uh, a tragedy to basically um, therefore go after people's weaponry, their guns, their right to arms, um, use that as an excuse to be able to do so and um, not only that economic details of course and um, many other things virtue signaling to minority groups which is something that we see all the time uh, when left left leading leaders are in place uh, we've seen all this sort of happening before and it's just getting worse and i think another thing to note is that she really is uh, the exact opposite of what somebody um, that would see themselves as a, uh, a traditional sort of uh, conservative person would be. I mean, she's someone that uh, really has always put that out there. Yeah, you're, you're right that uh, well, any uh, world leader exploits a, a tragedy for political advantage. But uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, uh, post uh, the, the Christchurch uh, massacre, she's uh, used that to pursue an anti-freedom agenda. You mentioned the, the gun control, which is in its second phase now, which is registering all firearms in New Zealand, basically cataloging, you know, who are the firearm owners and where, where are they keeping them, really uh, big brother stuff. And then there was the crackdown on, on free speech post the, the massacre where uh, the ISPs were uh, forced to, to censor websites in New Zealand. You had uh, New Zealand security uh, visiting people at their, their houses uh, where uh, if they would posted something that was in support of, of Donald Trump, uh, ba basically, that was that was going to be a sign of extremism. Let's not forget that a man who shared the the mosque shooting video he was sentenced to twenty one months in in prison just for that act of of sharing it. And so there's quite uh, sinister things going on uh, in New Zealand. And uh, you have to remember that the most outrageous thing about her being in the position of prime minister is that she's propped up by a self-proclaimed nationalist in in Winston Peters who chose to make her prime minister over the conservative national party in New Zealand and he said yes we'll crack down on free speech yes we'll crack down on guns he's just basically said yes 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 yeah that's an interesting point there um first of all in reference to the person that shared the video, that is quite scary that someone could get so much jail time simply for sharing a, uh, a violent uh, a video online. Now, I mean, you have to put this into perspective here. Why is it this tragedy is seen as somehow a lot worse than any other tragedy that has happened? Even tragedies that have happened on a bigger scale uh, are, are just you know, not even talked about in the media. I mean, on that same week that that happened, we also had, um, you know, uh, many uh, Christians in Nigeria that were slaughtered. We had bombings in um, in Palestine and Israel, for instance. There was other, even a, a church attack in the Philippines. I mean, I remember this was all happening at the same time as Christchurch, yet the media was all onto Christchurch and nothing else seemed to be a, of importance. And not only that, there's violent content all over the internet. I mean, you could look up ISIS beheadings any day of the week if you wanted to and watch them without any problem. Not that I, uh, I would advise people to be looking that kind of content up, but it's there if you wanted to watch it. Yet, that's not a jailable offence, but this is. So what's the difference there? Why is this so much worse? And second of all, with Winston Peters, that is a very uh, big disappointment because you expect more out of a nationalist leader. I'm not sure if he was looking at it simply um, that he may have had some uh, ideological ties on economics, being a nationalist and, and, and a Labor Party that might have had some similar views there. But uh, with all the damage there, uh, and especially with uh, Ardern, which is a very uh, uh, progressive left leader and not one of your old school type of Labor leaders, it doesn't seem to be a... a a match. I don't know why he went for that option. I'm still trying to think about what could have been that triggered that. Um, I, I do know that uh, you had mentioned earlier that maybe it was just because uh, he wanted to be the acting PM for a couple of weeks. Yeah, well, she, I, I Jacinda really, Ardern was on maternity yeah. leave. She was away for six weeks, and so uh, Winston Peters, well, 
he's a career politician and so even if it's only for six weeks get to be acting prime minister that's good enough for him to uh, sell sell his party and the country short well that's right but i mean that that is selling it a lot short i mean i just don't i don't see anything that has happened in new zealand over uh the past uh year or two uh i don't think any nationalist politics has happened at all i, I really don't said i don't know what we Peter's as apart from that has got it out of this because none of his party policies have been implemented I don't see him uh, having any influence on the Labor Party agenda. So it's a real shame, you know, it really is. I think uh, people were expecting more and unfortunately they're disappointed in it. Well, the only voice of reason left in the parliament is uh, David Seymour, who's the lone ACT MP, which is ACT as the, the Libertarian Party in New Zealand. He's the only one who's voted against uh, these gun control measures and is standing up for, for free speech. now. Libertarian parties, they they sort of tread very carefully on on things such as this. But uh, David Seymour, he's been adamant that freedom must be protected uh, post Christchurch. Well, that is an important issue, and um, I'm glad that somebody is standing up for that um, that freedom because it is really an important issue. And one thing that I do take from this that is actually um, interesting and uh, comfort comforting is that a lot of people have chosen uh, to not hand their weapons in and only a very, very little amount of people have. So that is something that I can actually look with, um, with content and say, well, it looks like people have learned, uh, especially since this kind of um, effect happened uh, over in Port Arthur, only, uh, well, 1996, so 23 years ago. So people in Christchurch, because it's happened before, they were able to look at what went on and how it worked and said, well, this isn't for us. I don't know what the consequences of this are. And we called it straight away. As soon as Christchurch happened, we knew straight away, yep, this is going to be a gun control inflicting uh, um, a government now that's going to go on a warpath on, on guns. We, we just knew that this is what was going to happen. So uh, in saying that, I mean, it was kind of shocking that they went down that route because I would have thought that because of it happening previously, that they would have come to the conclusion that many people would have predicted it and that it wouldn't have been a surprise. And so in, in, in that sort of fact, I would have thought that it would be a silly option to go with because of that, that uh, there would have been a lot of uh, hostility that was people were expecting it. Unlike with Port Arthur, that, that was a different situation. There was a lot of um, people that were combating that sort of um, action and was going against it. But because it hadn't happened uh, previously, we weren't able to look to other countries and say, OK, this is a country that went down that particular path. Whereas New Zealand and Australia are very connected uh, by location and culture and so forth. And for it to happen only 23 years ago, a lot of people living in New Zealand would have remembered it and would have said, okay, this is a similarity here that um, I know what's going on. I'm not gonna hand my gun in for the you know, couple hundred dollars or whatever the government's gonna pay me to hand it in. It's not worth it uh, based on uh, these freedoms that you speak of that are very important to a lot of people. So I think it's, um, it's great that people have stood up and not handed it in. And yeah, you know, um, it looks like that the, the government sooner or later, especially the way our dirt is going is that they're gonna send um, uh, SWAT teams uh, busting in, um, you know, house by house, you know, trying to search for guns because at this rate, they're not really getting any. Now, Jacinda Ardern, she didn't just come to Australia to speak with the, the Melbourne lovies. She was also on a diplomatic uh, mission. Uh, she uh, wanted to, to speak uh, with uh, Scott Morrison uh, to object to Australia's uh, new policy since uh, 2014 of uh, deporting uh, criminals who are non-citizens who happen to be citizens of New Zealand. Now, she described this as a corrosive aspect of the, the relationship, but uh, Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton said, we're going to put Australia first, we're going to protect our nation from pedophiles. Uh, Anthony Albanese, he was actually on the Today Show uh, when Peter Dutton said this. Albanese said, yeah, we think that the balance is right with this policy. And ScoMo said, like, look, this is nothing against uh, New Zealand. Like, 
we we deport all non-citizen criminals regardless of whether they come from new zealand or or any other place and so uh, she she came back from new zealand empty-handed uh, they're both Australian major party said no we want to get rid of these criminals because any country where, like, if you can get rid of the the criminals in your country by deporting them somewhere else you're gonna do it and so why 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 not do it if they if you can get rid of them away from your citizens forever then then that's a good thing and so Jacinda Ardern she well when she was interviewed by Lisa Wilkinson on the Sunday project and she was asked about calling out corrosive she was sort of like oh I I, I, I didn't mean to uh, uh, play the the tension there but we're just speaking frankly as friends because we we, we are such our good sure. friends we can have this open conversation of, you know there's there's no real tension and so she she basically conceded defeat and that australia was having none of that well i think she was very smug very cocky in their approach in that how she uh, went to the media and basically you know corrosive uh a relationship there and how such an issue which really i mean when it comes down to it you think how is this an issue at all i mean really it's nothing yet she tried to elevate and, and dramatize something that has no importance i mean like you said it, it it's important for a country that if we have uh criminals here and they are from new zealand to send them back i think that's a fair policy to have and likewise if it's the other way around I'm sure they would do the same, and they would send uh, Australians back to over here if they were uh, if they were causing havoc um, over on their shores. So really, I don't understand why it was an issue. Uh, the way that she uh, went on about it in the media, I mean, I'm sure there was a lot more different topics of conversation that could have been had that was more relevant to what uh, people are facing, and they could have spoken on, on multiple topics but not 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 something this small you know that really played nothing and i think the leader should have went that a, a little bit harsher i think because the way that she tried to embarrass our um our government I, I think they should have really put it to task and gone on the media and spoken a bit harshly about her and made her out to be a fool you know rather than sort of you know uh um you know play played it off and and, and try to make it go down and and it, and yeah, you know, I think they, they should have really went at her a little bit harder. Uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Well, it was quite fitting that on her way back to New Zealand, well, her New Zealand Defence Force uh, charter flight had actually broke down and was grounded, and so she had to catch a commercial flight back. But I think by the end of it, uh, we we're all pleased to see her go home. And, you know, despite this uh, poll that was uh, put out uh, by... Uh, or it was it was called the believability index which said that Jacinda Ardern was the the most trusted politician in Australia at 77 percent above all our uh, politicians I think after how she uh, embarrassed herself this week we're all happy for her to uh, go home and her to go back to New Zealand and glad that she's not our prime minister well I think after recent times we could put to rest that polls are really um not not as factual as we make them out to believe i just really don't see that i don't see that much of a, a crowd behind us i mean sure there, there's you're going to have that uh especially you know from the green type of class people um that vote that particular way would love it i mean no doubt about it but the majority of people from the conservative wing also plus old school sort of labor rights uh more nationalist sort of inclined Types, I think, would like her um, either way. So I, re I reckon that she would have a small following. I don't think it's a, a big following at all because she's very radical. I, I think that that's the way it is. And, and anyone that is actually against that policy approach, I mean, I would be happy to invite them to uh, volunteer to hold these criminals in their own houses, <laughs> see, you know, see how they would like it. And we've, we've spoken on this issue so many times. I mean, same with immigration, mass immigration, they advocate for it, yet they don't want them in their suburbs. They want them in the poor areas where, you know, then those people have to put up with them and, and deal with them. I mean, we see that countless, you know, amount of times. And I mean, we used to talk about it with Malcolm Turnbull and, and others that lived in really high class areas and you never get any immigrants or any criminals or anyone in that really clean areas, non-violent areas. But then they're all shipped to the working class neighbourhoods and then they have to then go through all the trouble and stuff that they have to go through. 
Um, and that's where the, the big divide is. I mean, if you're not willing to put your hand up and accept these type of people in your own house, then why should you force it on anybody else and force other people to take them in? And it's just such a hypocritical stance to have. I managed to bring myself to watch the Adam Goods documentary, The Final Quarter, which was on Network 10 uh, last Thursday. Now, this documentary, it was about the, the end of his career, the, the, the booing saga. It didn't offer any new analysis, exclusive footage or interviews. It was simply a whole bunch of media clips uh, f uh, beginning in 2013 when he singled out that 13-year-old girl who called him an ape up until uh, the end of his career where... Uh, in his last uh, games, he was booed uh, ferociously every time he, he got the ball. And it was followed by an, a special episode of The Project afterwards where Waleed Ali was, was joined by AFL uh, Indigenous advocates and, and sports journalists where they all said, oh yes, this was a shameful episode. Adam Goods was uh, uh, ra racially booed out of the game. Uh, it, it was so uh, terrible for Australia as a whole. That That's the consensus now because the, the AFL put out an apology in advance saying we should have done more at the time to, to, to stop the booing. But it's, it's important to go through because it does, it does go through uh, what started it all, which was uh, this 13-year-old girl uh, who called him an ape, who he singled out in the crowd. And she, were, she was taken away, away, uh, away from, I think she was with, with her grandmother, to an interrogation room uh, where, I, I don't know what was said there, but that, that, that's pretty scary for a 13-year-old to, to I, I thought the left was against family uh, separation. Uh, but yeah, she, she was treated like, basically like she was some sort of uh, terrorist. And, and then the next day, Adam Good said uh, uh, she was the, the face of racism in Australia. Now, uh, the, the left, they say, oh, but Adam Good said, oh, it wasn't her fault. I don't want to be victimized. But he basically said, Adam Good, that she's a representative of like original sin, like racism, that uh, you know, Australians say are, are racist. It's, it's born into us uh, from the, the time that we are born. And this girl is the example of it, basically saying, you know, she's been, she's the perfect example of being ra raised a racist. So she was singled out. She was, you know, put up as uh, this is what's wrong with Australia. Yeah, she was. I mean, and she was singled out because of the colour of her skin. And the, the worst thing about it, like you mentioned, was that she was so young, 13 years old. Now, she's over at a game. It's quite common for people that really get involved in a, a match of some sort, no matter what the sport is, to taunt the other uh, opponents. I mean, this is something that happens quite often. And it seemed to be in the spirit of the game that people do this, to get really involved because otherwise it's no different to watching it at home on TV. I mean, when people go in there, they really want to feel like they're part of it. So when you have a, a teenager there, innocent teenager, and she's, um, you know, calling someone an ape, I mean, really, now when people come out and say that that's a racist term, then they're implying that somehow apes are connected to Aboriginal people. So that's a racist thought in the first place. Well, um, you have to remember at the time yeah. that Adam Goods, like, he had a, a beard and he's got, like, black hair. So, like, yeah, yeah. like, a lot of people pointed out that, well, forget about his race. Like, any man who sort of has, like, a lot of, like, uh, facial facial hair, uh, uh, like, is hairy all over, like, they're, they're often, like, called a gorilla or, or whatever. I remember uh, Jason Dunstall, who was the, the Hawthorne uh, player, if he's white, he was referred to as the the, the chief and uh, commonly referred to as an ape because of the the way that he was he was built. Jason Dunstall's white. Nobody objected to that at the time. That's right, and it's common. Like I said, I mean, if someone is hairy, I mean, that's an observation that you make, and um, apes tend to be hairy, of course. So that that is um, that is something that you connect the dots there. And people can make that observation that it's a very similar, um, you know, that, that someone that's hairy looks like an ape. Um, it's nothing to do with race, I don't think. And, I mean, to imply that it does is to basically put that stereotype out there. I mean, this is, this is what I mean, that the left, when they complain about racism, and um, that they're basically causing a lot of it themselves because 
they're continuing to play this victimhood, these, these victim cards that really does them harm rather than good. Rather than saying that, um, oh, you know, that everybody, you know, that there's no issue here and that it really doesn't, doesn't make a difference who, what, what colour the sports star is and, and so forth, uh, they're, they're going on this um, continual virtue signal of any minority group, really, whoever it is, it doesn't matter. And this is what happens here, you know? Like, I mean, people take it personally. What does that mean exactly? I mean, you know, that, that implies that somehow that there's a connection there. Now, that, that's quite racist to imply there's a connection. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't think that that's the case. They'll think, well, you know, an ape could be even used just as a derogatory term, it's just like calling someone a dog. Now, if you call someone a dog, that that's just like, um, you know, calling someone out that you don't like and, and calling them a name that would be seen as derogatory. Now, it doesn't mean that it's connected with race. But for instance, if it's said to a, um, a person of a minority, like an Aboriginal, it's seen as a racist slur. If it's uh, put to someone that's white, then it's nothing and swept under the rug. So there is a problem there that we need to see that words are words and, and people are taking these things very seriously and it really this pc approach is is destroying the game destroying society as a whole and there's been so many posts there the adam goods booing saga there's been so many uh racist uh, scandals in the the afl which they've been keen to clamp down on in in 2016 a a port adelaide uh supporter uh she was uh publicly shamed because she threw a banana at uh, Adelaide Indigenous footballer uh, uh, Eddie Betts, the implication being that she thought that he was a, a monkey and so wanted a banana. And so this is the, well, the yeah. sort of logical leap that, that we've, we've gone to. And it's gone to the comment, like, people on social media, like, say, like, offensive things all the time, but it's been picked up, like, comments that have like called indigenous players monkeys and there was even one where a uh, port adelaide uh, player uh, uh patty Ryder, uh underneath a photo uh photo of him somebody put banana emojis and that was a story as well just the afl is wanting like even just comments like people make offensive comments on facebook all the time but you know that's a afl racism scandal now this sort of overcorrection that's right. And I mean, likewise, in that case, someone chucks a banana. That's because it was the closest thing they had that they wanted to chuck. Yeah, I don't think they, the they, 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 like, <laughs> it was premeditated. They, they deliberately went no. to the, the football to, to throw a banana at an Indigenous player because they That's wanted right. to be racist. Yeah, no, no, definitely not. I mean, it, it's, it's quite common that if someone wants to throw something, they'll just throw something, you know, a lot of the time it's a I mean, she shouldn't have thrown it. Like, you shouldn't throw stuff at AFL no. players, but... No, no, that's that's correct. But I mean, it shouldn't be then used as a whole. Let's virtue signal to minority groups and make this a racist case and continue. I mean, and this, this is the sad, the sad uh, problem with this situation that we're having here. Um, rather than just calling it out like, oh, this was wrong because you know it's a you know violent thing to do to throw something at someone, but instead of using using that, which is the common sense approach, they're they're naming race and going on this massive. Um, attack and really does a lot of harm um, so th th this is a sad situation we're seeing it in sport more often and I, I think it's something that people really need to go to watch the games for the game and not continue pushing these uh, these radical uh, PC ideologies and, and trying to clamp down and attack people it it's sad you know I mean this is really bringing the game in disre disrepute We'll go back to the chronologuing that Adam Good's doing saga, but because he like was so noble in standing up to to racism, and we should also take a moment to shame Eddie Maguire, who uh, a few days later, because uh, he because it was they were versing Collingwood that night, the the, the Sydney Swans, and so Eddie Maguire apologised to Adam Goods on behalf of the Collingwood Football Club for this offensive uh, fan. But then a few days later on the radio, Eddie Maguire s suggested that Adam Goods could promote. King Kong, which given what had just transpired, like that is way worse than what the 13 year old girl said. But because Eddie Maguire is so intertwined with 
AFL world, he wasn't disciplined as well. He just sort of gave a few press conferences where he was like, oh, I'm very sorry and uh, I shouldn't have done this. Yeah, I mean, either way, I don't think any, anything should have come from either, either situation because it, it is words at the end of the day and people should be free to be able to um, say such things, whether people like it or not. Now, um, in reference to Adam Goods, is um, a lot of people would say that he was uh, pro propagating um, doing his war dance, that he was intimidating a lot of people. Yeah, that and, was uh, that, that was back in 2015. Yeah. We'll we'll get to that yeah. in a moment, but we'll we'll go back because of his standard racism. He was the the 2014 Australian of the Year, and rewatching this documentary, it seemed he got uh, sucked into to that sort of. Uh, Aboriginal grievance industry because he was asked uh, like is Australia Day racist is it uh, is it Invasion Day and he was sort of like oh I still like Australia Day but I can understand why people uh, are offensive and then he also got sucked in by John Pilger's documentary uh, Utopia which well despite the the billions of dollars Australian successive governments have spent on uh, Aboriginal welfare and advancement it hasn't done anything John Pilger he, he presented this documentary that, oh, it's because our, our governments are, are still racist and, you know, secretly putting down in Indigenous people. And Adam Goods was sucked in by this saying, oh, you know, this documentary needs to be seen by more people. We need to acknowledge the, the shame and racism in, in, in our history. And uh, there was also another bit in the, the documentary where he was asked by somebody from the BBC, how racist is Australia? And he was sort of goaded to sort of say like, oh yes, Australia is such a, a terrible place. Like, because the, the more he said that uh, Australians were racist, our history was racist, the more he got patted on the back by the Aboriginal grievance industry. And so he became in a bubble. And while he was uh, enjoying the praise there, the AFL public, the, the people that pay his wages every week by going to the footy, buying merchandise, watching on TV, they were really resenting that he, were, he was basically saying that Australians were, were racist and, and, and discriminatory. And, and that's when the, the, the booing started, that they were really resentful of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, the, there was a, a stance that he decided to make there for his own... Um, whether it be fame or whatever he wanted to achieve, and it backfired on him. But then when it was uh, shoe on the other foot, he didn't like it, and then he then responded, like I said, with a war dance and so forth, and it just kept going on. But, I mean, it, it just seems to me that if there really was a racist culture and it was as bad as he said it was, then he wouldn't have even been a, able to be a football star in the first place. I yeah. mean, there was no way... There was no way that he would be able to be uh, wealthy and be successful in his um, in his uh, particular sport of choice if it was a racist nation that, that wouldn't have allowed such a thing to occur in the first place. I mean, he was a player since 1999. He won two premierships with the Sydney Swans, two Brownlow medals. And we should also, we haven't pointed out yet that Adam Goods is only half Aboriginal. His father was Scottish. And so he he made all these statements, I'm a proud Aboriginal man, yet there's this other half of his ancestry which is which is white. And so when he's saying all these like shameful things about white Australia, like is he hating half of himself? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. I mean we see this ongoing all the time. I mean, every every time you, you see someone that uh, has a percentage of Aboriginal in them. And it seems to me that sometimes the, the less of a percent it is, the worse they are. Um, if, if you get someone that is only 5% Aboriginal, they will virtue signal the hell out of that 5% and um, go on about how you know connected they are to that Aboriginal um, ethnicity or ancestry, so to speak. Yet the whole other 95% of their white background is shit to them. And um, you, you, it makes you think sometimes, how can you reject a, uh, a background or a culture or a race uh, or, or whatever that has uh, basically achieved more than any, anyone else ever has. I mean, the, you know, being of European ancestry, I mean, very successful. Um, if you're looking at, um, you know, culture and racial backgrounds and whatever, you know, it could be stereotypical that you're looking at it. But I mean, when you look at success and what, you know, inventions they've been able to come up with and what, what they've been able to achieve over the thousands of years, 
they've achieved more than anyone, yet they've shunned that past and only virtue signal on, on that, you know, the tribal group uh, ancestry of that 5%. Um, I mean, if you if you go to at least someone that is a full Aboriginal person of ancestry, they're very different. They're very different and a lot more, normally they're a lot more respectful as people. But when you always get these, um, these half Aboriginal or quarter or one eighth or whatever, they tend to have this chip on their shoulder and they do everything they can to elevate their status of Aboriginal and downgrade their status of whatever percentage they are that are white. And normally they don't even look Aboriginal to start with. And the reason for that is because being Aboriginal is a privilege. It's something that, um, you know, they make more money on when it comes to Centrelink payments. I know a lot of people that are getting twice as much money just because of, you know, that 5% Aboriginal that they have in them. I mean, how that is able to exist, I don't understand because it's such a discriminating sort of policy to have in place. But um, that, that is racism, really. I mean, when you have um, that, when you have jobs, that are only available to Aboriginal people. I mean, how is that possible? How is that not racist? I mean, there's no way that somebody could advertise a job and say white people only apply, yet you could put Aboriginal people only. How, how can that possibly happen? I mean, that is privilege. We have yeah. done so much through various governments to correct Aboriginal disadvantage, but you're right in what you say that there's, well, it's been proven that there's been a lot of rotting of this over the years. Now, the booing of Adam Goods, it, it reached its peak in, in 2015, and uh, this is when the, the media started to really talk about it, and there was debate whether it was, was racist or not. It, it seemed to me, because AFL fans, they, they put up with a lot of social justice PC bullshit from the, the AFL hierarchy. I mean, they've had the Indigenous round for uh, over, a, over a decade now with the Dreamtime game at the, the, the MCG. They have multicultural rounds celebrating the, all, all the different races that now play the game now, though that it sort of seems to be about promoting uh, Muslims in the game, the, the multicultural round, it seems. And of course, they've got the, the gay pride round uh, now where they had uh, gender neutral bathrooms there. So they tolerate a lot, the, the AFL fans, but it just seemed Adam Goods pushed them too far and they, they just cracked it. Like, like recently how the AFL fans, they cracked it with the behavioral awareness officers who were telling them off for uh, uh, cheering too loudly. There, there is a point where the fans, it's like, I don't, I don't come to the football to be, to be put down be treated treated as a, a second class citizen, a dreg. No, I'm I've, I'm not going to cop this anymore. And so, booing Adam Goods, it was you know, you know we don't we don't like you know how you're treating us. You know how you're basically shitting on us as uh, as society at whole. And so that's why you had so many boos. That's why because AFL stadiums they can fit what 40, 50, 60 thousand people in it. There was a lot of booze there for that to get on TV. Yeah, I mean, I, I just hate the fact that they are always politicising these events. I mean, just leave it as a, a sporting match, and that's what it is. That's what people want it to be. Let people boo the other side, and then the other side can boo them back. I mean, if you think that's bad, I mean, you should go and watch a, a derby match over in Europe in the soccer. I mean, and then you tell me or whatever. I mean, if they, if they think that booing a player over here is such a scandal... I mean, overseas, in, in some countries, they're setting fires in the stadiums, they're throwing bottles, they're, 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 they're going absolutely nuts. I mean, that, that is like what you would call scandalous. And over there, it's not even seen as a big issue because it's such a common place. Whereas here, just saying a couple of words, a boo, is such a big deal. And that's what's scary here. I mean, it's really scary when you compare it to other places that are a lot worse. I mean, with the PC garbage, like you said, the LGBT stuff that's pushed down people's throats, uh, multicultural stuff. Another thing that you have to understand here is even though they're catering to these minority groups, the minority groups are really small. I mean, how many Aboriginals in the country? 2%. Um, well, there's LGBT a lot that play are... AFL. I mean, AFL has had a, oh, yeah, a rich sure. history 100%. of Indigenous yeah. players, and they are some of the best. 
Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's correct. That's correct. But I mean, we, all these little groups, the LGBT make about three percent. I mean, how many people in the LGBT crowd really get into the football? I well, mean, there's I no I mean, male uh, gay players, but there's a lot in the the AFL W yeah. that are lesbians. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's fair enough. But I mean, like you said, it's it's such a small number that even though you're to cater and prop up these little groups of people at the same time then you're knocking a lot of people a lot more people that would be against such a move so you're trying to prop someone up and then you're trying to piss other people off that are very loyal to your game and when you do that it's not a very good strategy because you're going to end up losing a lot more um, supporters and a lot more people that go watch the games than gaining I mean, I, I really don't understand. I mean, I don't think someone that's gay at home on the TV is going to say, all of a sudden, I'm going to go and watch the footy now because they're pandering to me. I mean, I don't really think, if they're going to be interested in football, they're going to go see it regardless. Not because they're spewing some LGBT stuff or whatever on, on the TV, and likewise any other multicultural stuff either. People aren't going to go, oh yeah, I saw this on the news, it looks like the football is really catering to me now. All of a sudden, I'm going to enjoy the game and start watching it. I mean, that doesn't happen. You either like the sport or you don't like the sport. And by doing this, people that do like the sport and support it are going to get pissed off and not go to the games and they're going to lose money. It's that simple. When I watched the, the project analysis afterwards, because one of the, the arguments that was put forward that the, the booing was not racist because there's, there's other Indigenous players who play the game and they don't get booed, but they all said, oh, it's because Adam Good stood up for, uh, uh, to racism and it seems that the AFL uh, fans, they only like Indigenous players if they you know, shut up and just play football. Well, there's been plenty of Indigenous players who've uh, done things for Aboriginal welfare and disadvantage, but you can do that. You can you know, work in you know remote communities, like help help young kids without accusing white people of being racist. It's possible to do one without the other. Exactly. I mean, we see this in sports all the time. That at the end of the day, people aren't going to like assholes. As simple as that. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're uh, an Aboriginal, uh, whether you're white. I mean. We see it in the tennis all the time. Quite, quite popular uh, sort of situations of tennis. Uh, people like Kyrgios, for instance, Tomic and stuff like that. Um, that a lot of people hate them because of the way they act. And they're, they're, they're basically brats. You know, very mature and their attitudes to the sport. It's not because, you know, they're of a particular background that they hate them. Whereas on the other foot, there's Aboriginal players that people absolutely love because uh, they've got a, a good attitude to the game, like, uh, for instance, Ash Barty, for instance. Uh, a lot of people support her, and they say quite the opposite of, uh, say, people like Kyrgios, that she is um, someone that is uh, very noble, very nice, and, and so forth, and a lot of people support her. And she's got uh, an Aboriginal history, yet people really support her. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter who they, who, what background they come from. People look at the character. And the character determines whether someone will like you or not. I mean, a lot of people dislike Anthony Mundine, not because he's Aboriginal, but because a lot of people don't like his attitude and he just happens to be Aboriginal. Likewise, we see a lot of people that are white that aren't very well liked either. So it, it quite simply is to do with the person's character, how they um, perform and how, what their attitude is on when they play the particular sport and even off field as well, what kind of life they live and what, how they speak and so forth. And there's a lot of factors in place, but that, that's what it's about. So, I mean, people don't dislike someone because they're of a particular background when it comes to sport. They support a particular team, um, a particular, you know, whether it be uh, the country of Australia, whether it be a particular uh, town and so forth. That, that's what they're supporting. And if you're a player in that team, then you're going to be supported unless you do something that makes them lose that support of you. Uh, that, that, that is how I see it, and I think most people see it that way too. The other big story of the week was uh, Master Chef Judge uh, George Calambaris, or should I say former Master Chef uh, Judge. Uh, he recently uh, went uh, before the, the Fair Work Commission where it was found that his uh, MADE establishment, uh, 
his chain of restaurants, they admitted to underpaying their employees uh, 7.83 million uh, in wages. This was to five, uh, 515 employees over a decade. Now, he was fined uh, $200,000 uh, by the Fair, Fair Work uh, Commission, which was called a contrition uh, payment and obviously has to pay back the uh, the underpayment. And the thing that struck me is, wow, you managed to underpay your workers to, to, to that tune? Uh, I mean, surely somebody would have would have would have picked uh something up and the or I, i'd say that the kitchen knives were were out for for george uh after this uh, there there were demands for for him to uh, be sacked from from master chef and it broke uh this week that all three uh judges on master chef they would be departing after the the show's series finale because channel 10 decided to uh, deny them a 40% pay rise from their million plus salaries. And so checking out the reaction on social media, everyone was like, oh, the irony, he underpaid his workers and now he's leaving Network 10 because he feels he's being underpaid. Yeah, this, this is a sad case, but something that happens quite often. I mean, you only have to go speak to most people in hospitality and they'll say that this kind of activity is happening ongoing. And it seems like an industry that really stands out amongst most that is renowned for underpaying. Uh, I think people really need to, if, if, if people um, within the government and within um, partic particular, uh, whether it be the ADO and whoever else wants to examine anyone, they should be going after uh, hospitality industry more than anything, because that's the, the, the type of companies and the type of businesses that are doing this. I mean, I've spoken to people that are working in uh, like takeaway shops, uh, pizzerias and what whatnot, and they're you know adults, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they told me that they're getting paid 10 bucks an hour. You know, like I mean, this isn't a joke here. I mean, 10 bucks an hour, but because they're uh, in TAFE or university or whatever, and uh, they need the money, they end up doing the work. Now, I mean. Really, ten dollars an hour is peanuts, uh, especially with today's standards. And if they weren't living at home with their parents and they were trying to survive off that wage, um, there's no way they would be able to do it. And especially in that industry too, that you're not working full time. I mean, you're not working, uh, you know, forty hour a week a lot of the time unless you're in a cafe. But if you're in, say, um, a place that only serves dinner, then you're only doing three, four hours a night. So that makes it very difficult to sustain a wage in which you're able to survive and have that as a, a proper income. And especially when you're studying during the day, doing that for a little bit of side uh, money on the night time, I don't understand how people are going to be able to live off that, especially with the high cost of living pressures that they're suffering. So this is something that really needs to be sorted here. I mean, you can argue that um, wages are either too low or too high, but that isn't the issue. The issue is that people are getting paid ridiculous amounts here, um, ridiculous of shortage amounts. And I mean, this is not even like a couple of dollars under, this is like, you know, half wages. Half wages uh, that are half the minimum wage, for instance. Um, so that's really low, that, that is unsustainable. It's something that people can't live off and that's what makes it such a, a big deal. Well, as it's termed wage theft, it's it's become quite a common practice, or as you mentioned in the hospitality industry, but it's gained a lot of attention. And now the the Morrison government, you know, the uh, alleged uh, Liberal and National Party of workplace reform and uh, labour deregulation, they actually want to increase the the, the penalties for for uh, wage theft and, and underpayment. They actually want to make uh, deliberate systematic wage theft a, a criminal offence where it's, it's just a civil one at the moment. It seems that the coalition, they're still spooked by their, their work choices loss and that the, the union movement is just so aggressive these days. They've got their Change the Rules campaign to uh, uh, try and change the, the independent contracting arrangements of the, the gig economy. So they, they definitely feel that to remain in power, especially at a time when 
when real wages aren't rising, that they've sort of got to look like they're they're tough on on these employers and and on the on the side of the workers, but they're they're just not as socialist and class warfare as the Labor Party is. Yeah, I mean, I would actually argue that it's not wages that is the problem here. It's the cost of living that's the main problem because no matter how high the wage goes, the cost of living just goes a lot higher than that wage increase. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, I mean, if somebody was on a low wage, but it was just like it was back in our parents' time where the cost of living was so low and um, a lot more affordable, then it would be a case where people would be able to manage to live off so much less. So it wouldn't be such an issue. But the problem being today is that even at a, a minimum wage, that people are struggling on that, um, given the amount of, especially in the hospitality industry, because the hours that they're doing uh, is small amount of hours and they're unable to be able to uh, make enough within the week to be able to survive off it as income. And many of them uh, live with their parents, for instance, and that's why they're able to do it because they've got that support, they don't have to pay rent. Um, and I think that's where the bulk of payments would normally go if they were living on their own. But um, likewise, I mean, fair enough, somebody can uh, conversate with an employee, they could come to an arrangement and that's why there's a, there's a minimum wage, for instance, and instead of even paying a, a big rate, they can pay a, a, a rate that is just enough for them to basically cope. But nevertheless, um, when they're getting paid half the minimum wage, then there's got to be a, a line to be drawn there. I mean, there has to be a way where you can determine, okay, this is this is just taking advantage of people that are vulnerable, that really are in a situation where they need a little bit of pocket money and, um, you know, they're just basically greedy in how they're, you know, using them for that uh, service. And they have really not much of a choice because of the situation that they've been put in. Um, I mean, you can, you can, all, all you like, uh, talk about, you know, agreements and so forth. And I agree that uh, employers and employees can come to arrangements when it comes to pay. But likewise, I don't mind pay uh, being low, but that's if the cost of living was at a reasonable rate of, of standard too, which people would be able to then, like in previous time, be able to afford the daily, um, daily things that they need. And I'm not talking about uh, going and buying big screen TVs and all that. I'm just talking about the basics in uh, food and um, you know rent and, and that sort of thing. And if people are able to do that, uh, on a minimum, uh, then that would be fine. That would be perfectly fine, I think. Um, I think that's what, what really needs to be spoken about. I'm definitely in favour of more flexibility when it comes to, to workplace arrangements. And the, the Calendaris case, it, it has uh, opened up a debate around that. Uh, but the way that I come in it on his case is that the law is the law. It has to be quite, uh, applied equally and he clearly broke the law and underpaid his employees, and so he's got to pay uh, the, the price for that. Uh, but definitely, or it's, it's, as we mentioned, the hospitality industry, this is rampant. It's not because of greedy employers per se, it's because the employers are under a lot of pressure to, to make ends meet themselves, and so they, they cut corners and try and get, a, get away with things. I mean, being an employer is not, as as easy as you think and this is what was happening with the 7-eleven uh underpayment scandal is that the franchises were coming under a lot of cost pressures and so that's how they they found a way to, to cut corners as well so it's not a simple uh oppressor and oppressee there's a there's a combination of factors but yeah the high cost of living high high cost of uh supplies which is pushed up by things such as uh, energy uh, prices and or just the just the uh, just the cost of regulations pushing up everything that that's i think what we what we need to look at why things are so expensive in the first place which is pushing everything up and pushing people to the brink yeah well that, that, that's the pattern there so it's like a conveyor belt i mean the, the high price of living keeps going up and up and that's why then they have to push the wage up to be able to meet that, the wage only goes slowly up 
when compared to the cost of living. And like you said, also on the employer, that their supplies are going up in cost too, which then makes them um, feel like they have to cut corners to make a, a reasonable amount of money. Um, and I've seen this in small businesses all the time, and particularly, unfortunately, it is with the hospitality industry because they're only working a minimal amount of hours a day. Rather than a lot of them working full days, they're only doing, say, a dinner service. Um, a lot of them are like that. Um, or, or a lunch and a dinner, which is only a multiple uh, amount of hours per, per sitting. So, I mean, they're not really, the people working are getting um, the amount of hours needed to make a reasonable amount of income. Even if it was a, a, a good wage, it's still not much at the end of the week when you count it up. And the people that um, are running the show are uh, paying a lot more for their food and for, for whatever else they're purchasing, and that makes it hard on them too. I mean, I see this when I go to the shops. I'm doing my groceries. Groceries are going up skyrocket. I mean, just recently, uh, a popular cheese, uh, I buy Parmesan cheese, it used to be $16 a kilo, now it's $23 a kilo. It's gone up by $6 overnight. Bang, bang, just overnight. And no matter what uh, place I go to, I've went to several places, all the same. Um, so, you know, th this is the kind of thing that I'm seeing here. And, um, you know, th that's a massive hike, just 5 or $6 a kilo, just up like that. I mean, I've also spoken to people that are butchers and they're saying the same thing is happening to me. Um, that they have to put their prices up because of um, the cost that they are. So at the end of the day, everybody is feeling it, you know, and all it takes is one person to increase costs and then 10 other people under them then have to increase their costs because of the conveyor belt that, that occurs. And everybody ends up suffering in the end, you know, like, I mean, this is, this is what makes it very difficult. So I'm just hoping that uh, this uh, situation here um, that people are able to be a lot more careful, um, that they do follow the rules and the laws. I know someone on the radio the other day was saying that the award system is very difficult because there was about 20 different awards um, and it made it uh, very confusing to a lot of employers. That could be the case. But nevertheless, people have to make sure they're doing the right thing by the law and by their worker. At the same time, the worker obviously, you know, uh, has to understand uh, what the business is going through too. And uh, the business has to do their best considering the circumstance and somehow uh, strike a balance here. They have to obviously be able to afford everything and make money um, on the side uh, when it comes to what they're purchasing their supplies for and, and, and so forth. And then also um, give to their employees a reasonable amount too. So it's a balancing act really um, to make sure that everything goes accordingly. Well, I think the Calambaras wages scandal, it's certainly a microcosm of the, the economic problems that, that we're facing in Australia. Well, as always, we, we covered a lot of ground tonight. Hope we've, we've given our audience uh, all the details they need to digest these uh, major stories. Thank you again, Damien, for, for joining me, and we'll be back uh, for the, the next round of news next week. No, good for having me, Tim, and I'll look forward to it. And that's the show for today. As you'll have noticed this week, Waves is back to being produced at least twice a week, so expect another show in the coming days. There is plenty of other content that we are producing, such as Detonation by my colleague Steel Archer, featured on the Unshackled's YouTube channel. There is also, of course, the joint production we have with the XYZ and Rational Rise, The Uncuckables, live every Thursday at 8.30pm Melbourne time. Make sure you've subscribed to the Uncuckables dedicated YouTube channel, which continues to grow, to make sure you are notified when the show goes live or to catch up on previous shows. I would like to encourage you all again to bake free from big tech's information manipulation. So use DuckDuckGo for your search results, InfoGalactic for your information needs, and interact with others on free speech social media where you don't have to worry about uh, being banned. The Unshackled has a presence on all of these. We're on gab.com slash the Unshackled. We're also on minds.com slash the underscore Unshackled. We're also on mewe.com slash p slash the Unshackled. And we also have our growing telegram channel on the popular encrypted messaging service which all the alt media people are on you can find us there at t.me slash the unshackled remember that we cannot bring you all of this alternative content without your financial support we are on patreon.com slash the unshackled and paypal.me slash the unshackled we also have our premium membership option on our website theunshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate 
We are also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.